I'm back. Mr. Clark's back. Time to take a look at how the Axis powers begin to advance in World War II. First of all, you can see the imagery at the top of the screen there. You can see the German control here between 1939 and into the 1940s. You can see the Japanese control on the right side there and the Pacific campaign. Sometimes the fronts are referenced as world fronts, Western Front or Western Theater. Either one would be synonymous. Key objectives we'll be looking at as we move forward. We'll look at the course of German aggression and the British resistance in Europe. Look at the Nazi invasion, ultimately, of the Soviet Union and how Hitler double crosses Stalin. I like how the Japanese imperialism and the attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, brought a neutral United States into World War II. One, how did, the, how did Germany quickly overwhelm Poland in September 1939, which is when the war, World War II officially starts? They used a tactic that they'll use moving forward. It's called a Blitzkrieg, or lightning warfare, in which Germany attempted to quickly overwhelm the Polish forces. They would use this in other areas of Europe as well. The German Luftwaffe, which is their air force, bombed airfields, bridges, factories, and cities to kind of destroy the infrastructure in Poland in order to get them to surrender. So when you think about a blitz or the Blitzkrieg, if you know anything about, let's say, football, a blitz in football is when you have five offensive linemen who's designed to, and job is to protect the quarterback from getting attacked or hit. And a blitz is when you send an overwhelming number of defenders, more than five, at the quarterback in hopes of tackling the quarterback or sacking the quarterback and uh, stopping the offense on the other side. Two, what did Joseph Stalin's Soviet forces do once Hitler attacked? They moved into the east. So you remember the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact or the Nazi-Soviet pact. Those two sides, Hitler and Stalin had agreed to split Poland with the Soviet Union getting the eastern half of Poland and the Germans the western half. Three out of the British and French react to the attack on Poland. Well, they had been appeasing Nazi Germany for a long period of time, but they had a much more firm or stronger alliance with Poland. So they finally abandoned the appeasement policy, declaring war on the Axis powers, and then they began to prep and mobilize their forces for war. Okay, question number four. What happened during the winter of 1939 into 1940? And again, you should be thinking about these responses even before I discuss them with you to kind of see if you've understood any of the readings you've done and some of the work you've already prepped up and done previously. This was also known as the phony war. By phony war, they mean at this point in time, there wasn't a lot of hot fighting going on both sides as they were mobilizing and prepping more into the spring. They didn't really want to fight too much yet in here in the winter. The French began to dig in behind what they had constructed after World War I, the Maginot Line. This is a heavily defended line of forts and different things where their infantry and things like that are all prepped up and ready to go in case the Germans attack right across the German or French border. Great Britain, their forces fell in behind the French forces. Meanwhile, Joseph Stalin's forces took control. They kind of gobbled up additional territory for themselves in Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Five, what happened in April 1940? Hitler's forces used the Blitzkrieg tactics to quickly overrun places like Denmark and the Netherlands and then moving into Belgium next. So if you notice, Hitler's picking on the weaker countries first before attacking France or Great Britain. Six, after de defeating Belgium, what did Germany do next? Again, the French were surprised. Why they were surprised, nobody really knows. But they moved through Belgium and into France instead of going directly across the German-French borders. Keep in mind, the Germans knew that the French were building their forts and defending the Maginot Line across the border with Germany. So 
Why would they go through the most difficult spot? They instead found a spot, a point of weakness, and then they you know, basically pushed through there, pushed through the Ardennes, the forest in Belgium, and into France. The French, as we mentioned, had been reinforcing the Maginot Line along the German border, but they wrongfully assumed again that Germany would attack through there. Seven, what happened to the Allied forces as German forces continued to pour into France? They began to get pushed back, and they got pushed back further and further towards the coast in France, along the English Channel. So with the Allies being trapped at the coastal town of Dunkirk, British Prime Minister at the time, who had replaced Neville Chamberlain, who had appeased Hitler and turned out to be... Uh, you know, quite wrong about his take on Hitler. So now that Churchill's in power, the British have a much stronger prime minister. And he came up with a plan to save the troops at Dunkirk. You have some imagery here as well. So Churchill was a very motivational speaker. Churchill called on every single British citizen who had a tugboat, a rowboat, a sailboat, whatever it might be, to help evacuate the Allied troops along the coastal city of Dunkirk. They were commissioned, meaning they were added into the Royal Navy, special commission, you know, temporary you know, naval status. And you can see the map here, just so you can see an imagery of what looked like this is the English Channel. This is the narrow body of water that separates Great Britain, mainland Great Britain, a great, a great Britain from mainland New Europe and France. So Dunkirk is basically on the Belgium and French border. And so we can see the Ongoing uh, fighting on the right side there. That's an image there a rendering from the miracle at Dunkirk. Basically, all the soldiers trapped along the shore area. You see all the different, even smaller boats that are going to come here and kind of get these troops across the English Channel. Now, since it's a pretty narrow body of water, you know, 10, 15 miles at the most narrow point, a little wider than that, where Dunkirk would go to England. You know, these boats can make it across those areas. Obviously, they could be under fire from the German Luftwaffe Air Force, which were, you know, coming to try and hit the troops, but they didn't do a good enough job, at least on their side, and they allowed for uh, hundreds of thousands of troops to escape. I think it was just, you know, right around 300,000 troops who were able to evacuate back to Great Britain. Despite the miracle at Dunkirk, what happened to France? The French were forced to surrender to Adolf Hitler in Germany. France was lost. And to kind of rub it in the, the French, some salt in the French wounds at that point in time, to add insult to injury, the French had to sign over control of their country on the same railroad car that was in a museum in Paris that the Germans had signed an armistice ending and surrendering during World War One. So Hitler, I would say somewhat of a student of history, saw that that was a good way to kind of get at the French for a uh, the outcome of World War One. Ten, what was French General Charles de Gaulle able to do despite the French surrender? Now, Charles de Gaulle is, uh, you know, the equivalency of the Churchill figure in Great Britain, eventually, or a more accurate comparison might be the Dwight Eisenhower figure from the United States, the commander of American forces during World War II and a future president. Of the United States, Charles de Gaulle is a general in the French military and the future president of the next French Republic after World War II. So he established a French government in exile where he worked towards the general goal of liberating France from German control. Logistically, we'll look now at the four war fronts or the four theaters in World War II. As well as the two alliance systems. So the Western Front, this is taking place here when we were just describing and the fighting that went on in France, Great Britain. So it's basically the Axis powers versus France, Great Britain, later on the United States. Eastern Front would be the Axis, mostly Germany versus the Soviet Union. In North Africa, initially it's Italy for the Axis side and Great Britain for the Allies. Eventually Germany gets in on the side of the Axis. And then the United States comes in into North Africa to eventually win the North African front. And then in the Pacific front, primarily the United States versus Japan. 
but the Australians were a strong ally there and they did contribute some fighting forces. Here are the Allies versus the Axis powers. Now there's 30 something countries on the Allied side eventually, including like Canada, Australia, and many other countries, but primarily on the Allied side is Great Britain, France, eventually the Soviet Union and the United States. And then on the Axis powers, you have Germany, Italy, and Japan. It started out just Germany and Italy, and then later on Japan. 12, who are the two main generals in command of forces in North Africa? So once the Germans sent their troops in, basically to bail out the Italian troops, which were getting, suffering a beatdown from British General Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. These are the two sides there, the Axis and the Allies. The chief generals there were uh, the Desert Fox and Erwin Rommel, the German general, picked up that nickname because he had navigated the troops very uh, nimbly in the Sahara Desert, hence the Desert Fox, and then the British general Bernard Montgomery. So 13, the early results of fighting in Africa. You would see the Germans under Rommel begin to push the Allied troops around a little bit. El Alamein, we'll see later on, is going to be kind of the final big battle there. It's located right there on the Mediterranean Sea and in Egypt. Where were the Italian forces fighting in October 1940 after not being able or unable to hold off the front in North Africa? They began to fight in Greece. So not necessarily fighting the biggest powers in the world, and the Italians are less than stellar. 15, what are some of the technological advancements that were impacting World War II? Air warfare became more and more impactful. Submarines are on the side of the Germans, U-boats, more advanced bombs, and then radar, as you can see in the imagery here on the left, and sonar technology. See a German U-boat there on the right. In 1940, the Germans were attacking Great Britain in what would become known as the Battle of Britain. Winston Churchill gave a dramatic speech in response to Adolf Hitler. Hitler actually sent a telegram to or correspondence to Winston Churchill requesting that the uh, British surrender control of their country to Germany. And Winston Churchill, pictured here, said, we will never surrender. He had a famous quote here, he shall, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never, never surrender. And they did not. So between out of the Germans attacked the British on August 12, 1940. Well, obviously, since Great Britain is an island nation, they had to fight through air attacks. So they began the Battle of Britain. The German Luftwaffe began a daily bombing campaign off of England's southern coast. The British Royal Air Force, the RAF, seen in the photographs on the left, did its best to fight off the Germans. You can see here a British scout in the military is looking on, he's actually standing on top of a building trying to see the German planes are coming to attack. And then you see some of the numbers here in terms of the sheer fatalities and the devastation of fighting. So you can see here just from a number of pilots lost, 482 pilots lost, 544 crew members in total. The Germans lost 2,600 airmen or pilots. The Germans lost 1,887 planes. So basically what's going to happen over the course of time is the Germans are going to attack. And over the course of time, because Churchill said he would never surrender, eventually through attrition, meaning that eventually the Germans just say, okay, well, the British are never giving up. You know, we've lost, you know, almost 2,000 aircraft, 3,000, nearly 3,000 pilots, 2,600 pilots. You know, we cannot afford to continue to lose. 
So the German strategy began to change over the course of time. They began bombing non-military targets, including London, in hopes of breaking the spirit of the British to see if they would lose their will to fight. Many British living in London during the Battle of Britain were forced to live in underground shelters or in subways. Let me see a couple images here. Literally, British citizens are sleep, uh, sleeping on the railroad tracks. Piccadilly Circus is one of the more populated areas in London. There's another subway or underground train shelter. But what were the results of the constant bombings on London? 15,000 people died and much of the city itself was destroyed. That's why if you ever go to London, some buildings have numbers on them, like years in terms of when they were built. It's kind of unique to have some of the initial structures still standing. 21, a new technology really helped the British to hold off the Germans, and we alluded to before, radar. This allowed the British to more easily detect some of the incoming German planes. 22, why do you think the airstrike was important to Germany's plan to invade Great Britain? Well, Great Britain had a very strong navy, so Germany would have to secure air before invading the island nation. Twenty-three, and we saw some of the importance of Winston Churchill already during World War II. His confidence, his steadfast leadership and determination kept Great Britain strong during the Blitz. Great Britain was the only country defending democracy in Europe by 1940. It was necessary to keep the British morale and spirit high, which Churchill was able to do by his inspirational leadership. Okay, 24, what did Hitler do in June 1941 as he realized the British would never surrender? He made a mistake. He kind of abandoned his plans of taking control of Great Britain. Germans were losing too many planes each night, as we alluded to earlier. And instead, he decided to double cross Joseph Stalin and attack the Soviet Union. So when you think of this decision here, it quite obviously was a huge mistake. And we'll see this play out as we move forward. But... Had he actually put you know, full effort into invading Great Britain, he probably would have lost less lives than he lost when he fought in the Soviet Union, and perhaps he would have taken control of Great Britain, perhaps not making an enemy of Joseph Stalin, and World War II could have turned out differently. So as we look at different moments in history, we kind of look for the pivot points, the moments in which a bad decision or a good decision are made that ultimately impact the outcome of a war, the, the outcome of uh, and the impact on the planet, you just imagine had Hitler been a better leader and had stronger leadership in terms of his military, maybe he would have made better decisions and the outcome of the war might have been different. 25, how did Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union impact the Nazi-Soviet pact? Well, obviously that pact's over. Good word to use for that is to nullify the Nazi-Soviet pact because if it's a non-aggression pact and the other country attacks you, well, quite obviously the... Non-aggression pact has come to an end. Hitler betrayed Stalin, which obviously infuriated Stalin. 26, how prepared was Stalin for the German attack? Well, we know that Stalin had purged a lot of his military leadership and therefore ill-prepared. If you think about it too, he actually was trusting Hitler in some regard, so he's not necessarily expecting Hitler to double-cross him. So now we have to kind of look at 27 as to why Hitler would double cross Stalin and attack the Soviet Union. Well, a lot of it had to do with natural resources. He wanted natural resources, special oil, especially oil. Uh, he wanted forest, land, or lumber. The Ukraine was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, so he wanted the wheat and grain there. And he wanted to ultimately defeat communism and Stalin as he distrusted communism, didn't like that ideology. Operation Barbarossa was considered Hitler's greatest mistake. Why? Well, we've kind of figured that out already in some regards. But split his forces from the Western Front into the Eastern Front. He made an enemy of Stalin. It's possible, as I mentioned before, that Hitler could have won the war had he not made this mistake.
So as you look here, you can see Operation Barbarossa, kind of moving into these different regions here. Launched in June of 1941. How many Soviet troops were killed during the initial German advance? 2.5 million, unbelievable. So the sheer death of this war is going to be you know, beyond comprehension. 30, what did the Soviet troops do as they were forced to retreat? They had a, what was called a scorched earth campaign, meaning they burnt everything in the retreat, meaning they weren't leaving behind food, clothing, or shelter for the advancing German forces. And they were hoping to drag the battle into the Soviet winter, which would make it very difficult for the Germans to fight. See some of the imagery here. You can see how devastated Stalingrad was from the ongoing fighting. Okay, so the whole city is in rubble and ruin. So what happened in December 1941 as the German forces marched towards Moscow, much like Napoleon's forces 130 years previously, the great Russian general Winter, and that's a fictitious name, but Winter representing the Soviet Winter, or Russian Winter, destroyed the German war effort. But thousands of ill-supplied German troops simply froze to death. Thirty-two. When the Germans attacked the Soviet Union, what did Stalin agree to do? Stalin and Churchill they reached an agreement to work together against Hitler and the Axis powers. Sometimes my enemy of my enemy becomes my friend. So Stalin and Churchill not necessarily a natural alliance, but in the case here, when they had a natural and common enemy in Hitler, it seemed to be a kind of a, I guess, a prudent thing to do at that point in time. Thirty-three as World War II continued into 1941. What was the perspective of American president in the United States on the war? Well, as we know, the United States tried to stay neutral, but slowly but surely, they began to find ways to aid Great Britain as Franklin Roosevelt and Churchill kind of began to formulate a secret behind closed doors, you know, kind of alliance and uh, American support is kind of coming from our country. One of the key things that kind of brought Hitler, I mean, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt closer together was a secret meeting they had on board a ship off the coast of Newfoundland. There they met on the ship and they negotiated what would become remembered as the Atlantic Charter because the ship was on the Atlantic off the coast of Newfoundland. And in that secret meeting between Franklin Roosevelt, American president, and Winston Churchill, the leader of Great Britain, you see him there on top of the ship. Churchill there on the right, Roosevelt on the left. They decided that their dual plan would be to defeat Hitler and Nazism. After the war, they would advocate self-determination for nations, meaning that countries could, you know, countries would no longer be colony, colonies of conquering countries. They could determine their own history, their own culture, their own government moving forward, and they want to have a stronger permanent system to promote peace. This would become the United Nations eventually. 35 after talks broke down between the United States and Japan in December 1941. What happened on the 7th of December 1941? The Japanese attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. They basically, as some would say, they awakened a sleeping giant. The Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor wiped out much of the American naval fleet in the Pacific, including 19 ships, which were either damaged or destroyed, killed around 2,400 people. You can see the newspaper headline, Japan attacks the United States. You can see the fire there at Pearl Harbor as they hit. Uh, that's an airfield that's on fire there. 36, how did Roosevelt react to the Pearl Harbor attack? His quote was, this is a day that will live in infamy, and it has. It's one of those dates that everybody remembers in history, and one I suggest you do commit to memory as well, December 7th, 1941. 
And he asked Congress to declare war on the Axis powers in the United States, which had been neutral up until that point in time, was now officially in World War II on the side of the Allies. 37. Why was the Japanese bombing a huge mistake for Japan and the Axis powers? Well, many claimed that Japan had awakened a sleeping giant, which included not only the American military, but our ability to produce weapons for the war. We would be the chief supplier of much of the weapons moving forward for World War II. What were the early res results for Japan after their attack at Pearl Harbor? Well, Japan was dominating the Pacific Front for uh, some time during World War II, because when the United States did get involved, we concentrated a lot of our help and effort in the Western Front and in North Africa, and kind of just tried to tread water in the Pacific Front. Lesson reflection, how was the Japanese attack on the American base at Pearl Harbor, similar to the German invasion of Poland? Both were surprise attacks done before any declaration of war. So they were unprovoked and kind of aggressive acts in both cases. The attack in Poland obviously starts World War II itself, and the attack at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, brings the United States into the war, and the war is officially on. The United States is in the war. Hopefully you enjoyed our discussion today. And until next time, Mr. Clark is out.